We we'll start again with uh, the next the next talk. It's uh, from Chris and Ryan, both from Veracode, and they're going to um, share with us their experiences with real world agile as the LC. Thank you. Good afternoon. So over the past few years, there's been a significant increase in the use of agile methodologies for software development. And this shift has created a major challenge for security teams that are attempting to secure that software, especially when you compare it to traditional models like Waterfall. Agile typically means increased speed, lower latency, and that translates into resource constraints for security teams. The good news is that security within Agile can be done. It can be done well, and it can be done without dedicating full-time employees on the security side to the effort. But it does require some flexibility, which we'll get into. So we'd like to ask you to listen to how our process has evolved over the past couple of years and envision how you might be able to apply some of the processes and techniques that we'll cover uh, to your Agile teams back at home. I want you to take three things away from this presentation. First, um, you know, I want you to be able to ship more secure software. Second, <laughs> I want you to be able to learn from our successes and our failures, which is huge. You can save yourself a lot of time by just listening to what we did wrong. <laughs> and third, I want to help you uh, improve your relationship uh, between the security teams and the dev teams so that it's less adversarial and more of a partnership, despite the frustrations that are definitely going to arise uh, with Scrum teams. And of course, the clicker is not working. There we go. So just very brief introductions. My name is Chris Eng. I lead the security research team at Veracode. And, uh, I'm tasked with building all the security knowledge and intelligence into our product line, whether it's static analysis, dynamic analysis, uh, mobile. So everything we do, the security intelligence, comes from my team. I also share responsibility with our CISO for product security, so making sure that everything that we ship to our customers is, in fact, as secure as possible. I'll also introduce my coworker, Ryan O'Boyle. He works on my team, primarily responsible for researching new languages, platforms, frameworks, uh, to build, ex uh, extend support for our static analysis engine. He also spends about maybe a quarter of his time uh, spearheading our internal SDLC effort, so that's why we're speaking together today. So when Agile teams, uh, sorry, when development teams switch to Agile, uh, security teams can often be left behind. They're moving fast, and sometimes the security teams don't even realize that they've moved to Agile, and they're operating more on a waterfall model and on a you know, testing per release model. And so it's important to be kind of in sync with what the dev team is doing. The Program Management Institute, PMI, reported that there was a 3x increase in the use of Agile between 2008 and 2011. Gartner produced a report in uh, early 2012 speculating that by the end of 2012, 80% of all software development projects would be using some form of Agile. Now, it's unclear exactly what that means, if that means pure Agile Scrum or just some Agile rituals, but I think the number is probably in the correct ballpark, and directionally it's correct, right? It's increasing significantly. Now, I realize that not everybody here has a lot of experience with Agile Scrum. Um, actually, show of hands, who does Agile now? Okay, maybe that's why you came. So about half. But rather than put a huge uh, uh, number of slides on Agile Scrum terminology at the beginning, for those of you who don't live in that world, we're going to actually introduce concepts as we go. So we'll introduce the terminology that you need and only the stuff that you need. So there are some, there are some documents out there that attempt to describe how you should do security within Agile. If you go Google for it, you'll find Microsoft as the first couple of hits, and they have a guide on Agile SDL. Theoretically, this is a good starting point, but in reality, it has some limitations. And this is the problem with any sort of you know, best practice model, is that it's far too generic. It takes a very generic approach, and it makes some assumptions that you don't necessarily have. So you have assumptions about security expertise on the team. 
you have assumptions about uh, resource availability and bandwidth. And most importantly, they gloss over the complexities that come about when you, diff when you compare real-world development models to this idealized scrum team that they have in their guides. So they don't even account for situations as simple as two or three scrum teams working together to release one product. It's assumed to be a single scrum team, single product, and a very simplified model. So it's not something that really translates very well to the real world. So the way this talk is going to be structured is I'm going to give you a little bit of background on how we historically did SDL at Veracode. We'll just touch on that in a couple minutes. Ryan will spend about 20 minutes talking through what we've done over the past 18 to 24 months and how our security process has evolved within the company as we've tried different things. And then I'll come back at the end, talk about future, talk about challenges, and uh, wrap it up, take some Q&A. So that's, uh, that's our structure. So like any small company, especially in the early stages, we weren't doing a lot of security nearly as much as we should. Uh, you know, when I joined the company, we were 15 people, so you can imagine how, how bandwidth looked at the time. But we were doing some things, and this is all kind of before we switched into Scrum. We were doing static analysis. Every release, we were running, that's kind of funny, we were running our web platform through the previous version of the platform <laughs> to stand, scan it statically. That's our core product. So it's kind of nice because we got this for free. Now, sometimes I'd review those results. Sometimes the developers would review those results and escalate the things that they didn't understand to me. Sometimes, probably, nobody reviewed the results. There was no tracking. There was no sign-off. There was not a whole lot of rigor around how we did it. Uh, release schedules were every 6 to 12 weeks, and so it wasn't predictable. Sometimes things slipped through the cracks. Most of the time we caught it because we were small. We also luckily had a lot of pen testers on staff. I'm a former pen tester. A bunch of the people on my research team are also pen testers. And so we could uh, manually pen test a lot of the new features that would come about. So that's something we would do with regularity. And then we would also increase um, the coverage by bringing in third-party consultants to do more comprehensive testing, primarily for compliance reasons and to satisfy customers that we were using a third party and not just relying on our own internal people. And then finally, the third thing we were doing in the pre-Agile phase was developer consultation. So things like, hey, I'm going to build this feature to do file upload. How should I do that? What mistakes might I make? Can you look over my shoulder as I do this, as I design it? And um, I, would, I would walk them through it. The problem, again, is that that lightweight threat modeling was not built in to the feature spec. And so it didn't build into estimations. It, it was hard to predict how long it was going to take. And that led to you know, less predictability around the release itself. So what was good and what was bad about what we were doing in that phase? Well, again, it was good that we were doing any security testing at all. And it was actually pretty good that we were using multiple techniques to do it. We were using static, we were using manual pen testing, and we were doing some design consultation. This was good. What we lacked was structure and, uh, and complete lack of oversight. Things just weren't baked in the way that they should be, in the rigor that they should be. So it was possible for things to, to slip through. Now, of course, we were able to see things because we were a small, uh, a small company and uh, we could keep track of, you know, I could keep track in my head of what was going into the pipeline. Today, not so much. We're 250 people now. A lot more stuff is happening. And, you know, you can't just remember what's going into each release just by walking around the halls. So clearly what we needed is we needed more uh, structure. We needed more predictability. We need the trains to run on time in terms of the release. Today our releases go out every month on the last Thursday of the month. And everything... All the different teams that work together have to work towards that date. And so clearly, the structure and predictability was important for us as we, as we grew. So two years ago, roughly, we decided to start moving into Agile Scrum as a company. So why did we do that? We were at a phase in the company where we needed to evolve. We were growing quickly, hiring quickly, and we were going from a single team a dev team to multiple dev teams, a single product to multi-product, 
single site to multi-site. So we had to scale up very quickly. And with that, we needed to evolve and, and become more mature and, and have more predictability around what we were doing. There were a few other things that we also got out of this. Um, Scrum has a notion of continuous learning and evolving, and that's something that fit our culture very well. You have to constantly be asking yourself, what's working and what's not? And for the things that aren't working, what should we change to get better? And that's something that, you, that Agile really builds into the system. A nice side benefit was that as we were hiring very rapidly, using Scrum actually helped us get people up to speed quicker. Because if we hired a developer, imagine, from a company that developed all their software using Agile Scrum, that developer would walk in the door knowing exactly how we did things, exactly how the, the structure, the methodology, and the process worked. How we get work done was something that they already understood. All they had to do was you know, learn the product line and get into a team. But how you get work done just translates perfectly from one Scrum, uh, Scrum team to another, essentially. Now, you'll notice that all of this, this entire move to Agile Scrum, was precipitated by development needs with absolutely no regard for how it would affect security. And that's the right, I mean, that's the right choice. You don't make your development decisions based purely on security. But it was done without regard for security. So it was on, incumbent upon us as the security team to be aware of what was happening and adapt to how the business now wanted to develop software. So um, Ryan's going to walk you through how we've evolved in a few different phases over the past uh, couple of years and, uh, and how we've uh, made some adjustments along the way. Hello. <clears throat> uh, to start off, the first Scrum concept that we'll talk about today is what you'll hear called Scrum rituals or Scrum ceremonies, which are basically fancy words for meetings. Uh, I think people don't like the word meetings, especially in the Scrum context, so they try to avoid those terms. Uh, so the first meeting is the planning meeting. So this is at the start of every sprint or iteration, and this is the point where the development team meets with um, representatives about the product, and they choose what they're going to work on during that sprint. And it's important to note that the development team chooses how much work gets brought in. Second is the daily scrum, also sometimes called the daily stand-up, because frequently it's a standing meeting um, that's intended to be very short. And it's just a daily check-in to say what's been done so far, what's still to be done during this sprint, and are there any blockers that need to be dealt with to complete the sprint on time? Third is the review, or the demo, as it's also called, which is after the sprint has closed, so there's no work left to be done, and this is a chance to meet and review the work that was done and evaluate what new features or you know, bug fixes, whatever has been done. Then fourth is the retro. So while the review meeting is focused on the actual product, the retro is focused on the process and how things went in terms of the, the work that was done and how it was accomplished. So the, the, the review is kind of the what and the retro is the how. Okay, so the first phase of what we started when we knew that this team was moving to using Scrum was we, we knew that we wanted to have closer involvement with the development team. The benefit to us would be that we would have increased visibility into what they're working on so that we could evaluate that from the, the viewpoint of security of the product. The benefit to them is that our closer involvement would provide a more predictable security resource, so someone that they know they can talk to when they have questions, and it would provide more predictable security expectations. So us working more closely with them would help them know what we're expecting when they've finished that development for the sprint. 
so I started attending, uh, I think Chris had initially attended a couple times, but I started attending the planning meetings. So at the beginning of every sprint, uh, and these were two-week sprints, so every other Monday morning, I would attend their planning meeting. They would go through all of the stories that they were going to work on during that sprint. As they went through, I would have a chance to sort of raise my hand and say, I, I have a question or I have a concern about the security implications of that. Uh, and I was also there in sort of a consultative role where if they had questions about the security implications that they went in knowing that maybe they're not so sure about some of the possible implications, I was there to answer those questions. So, the result of reviewing these stories was usually that we would identify stories that required some sort of security action, whether that be a manual pen test or a development conversation, you know, a design review during the sprint. So these were things that we were already doing, but now we were starting to do them in a more structured sort of fashion. Similarly, we continued to do static scans for every release, but we started to track that a little closer and make sure that someone was reviewing the results, and better yet, a, someone from the security team was reviewing the results, whether that be myself, Chris Eng, or even our CISO, Chris Weisopel, at times. Okay, so what was good about that? We did achieve increased visibility, so we had a better sense of what was happening with the product and a better idea around the security implications. Also good, we were making sure that someone with security expertise was reviewing the static findings now. And in general, we were getting more closely aligned and working more in formation with the development team and trying to accommodate this new process that they were starting to use and uh, sort of meet them on their terms. So what was bad about this is it was not a very efficient use of the security representative's time, which in this case was me, because this was a, a two-hour meeting, which is pretty long, and the bulk of that meeting was not was not about talking about technical detail, never mind talking about security detail. It was largely final clarifications and discussions of how much work was involved and, you know, clarifying final details before deciding that this is something that the team could start working on. So a lot of my time in there was not valuable because we weren't focusing on issues that I could, you know, influence. Also, the team was rather large, which was a problem for a number of different reasons. It meant that the full two-hour time box meeting typically was at least a full two hours because uh, they're using such a large team that we later found out they're actually violating Scrum. And by the rules of Scrum, this was not actually a Scrum team because it was much too large. So the second Scrum concepts are what in Scrum are called the artifacts. So the first one is the product backlog. So this is just a list tracked in some manner of all of the development work that is to be or could be done on the product. So whether that be feature enhancements, bug fixes, it's a, a big list of what can be done on the product. And ideally it should be prioritized and well-groomed. What that means is it should be ordered with the most valuable work to be done at the top, which should also be nice and structured and well planned out so that a development team could work on this, you know, on a moment's notice. Second is the sprint backlog. So this is a smaller list of work to be done that during the planning meeting is actually taken in or moved into the sprint backlog 
this is what the development team is going to work on during any given sprint. At the end of the sprint, you have the product increment. So this is the shippable result of the work that was done during the sprint. And one of the goals of Scrum is that at the end of every iteration, you have something shippable. So in theory, you could have a release at the end of every sprint. So around this time, I was attending that one really long meeting and our, the development team for this product split into three teams, into much smaller teams that actually were within the, you know, the scope of what a scrum team is supposed to be. Uh, so that was just a, a notable change for the process. So phase two, we were trying to find a more effective use of my time than attending this really long meeting. And the approach we decided to take was to reduce the amount of time I had to spend by focusing in more on just having the conversation that needed to happen around security. So this meant instead of meeting with the whole team during planning, after planning, I would meet one-on-one -on -one with a, re a representative of that team. In this case, it was a development manager who was familiar with all the work happening. And we had this meeting time boxed to half an hour, usually would come in under maybe 15 minutes. And we would go through the sprint backlog. So we would go through the stories that the development team had already decided this is what we're going to do during this two week sprint. So in terms of what the security implications of these stories were and, and what the outcome of that conversation was, certain stories we would identify as, okay, this needs some security attention. And typically we would track that, and, and this was new that we were starting to actually track security, um, security work that needed to be done at all. But typically we were tracking it at the level of, you need to get security sign off before this is considered complete. We weren't tracking anything in much more detail than that. Um, one of the benefits of that process is the developers were now on the hook to have the representative from security meet with them, talk about the feature, or we also at this point started to introduce code review. You'll see our new icon for code review. Um, but the developers were the ones now that had the responsibility of making sure this security review happened so that they could get the final sign off they needed and consider this work done. We also, at this point, weren't just working with developers, we were working with testers as well. We started reviewing the QA test plans to see if they were doing tests that could help evaluate the security of the stories as preferably as part of their automated tests, but also through their manual tests and have repeatable security testing built into part of the regular testing that they were doing. So as I said, during this time, after we started doing this is when that three-way split actually happened and the development team that was one really large team became three. So again, trying to reduce the time commitment became a challenge because now I had to go through this process three times, once for each team versus just once. Also at this time, the development group was bringing in uh, a trainer to do some scrum training and we took that opportunity for me to go to that training and get a better understanding of what scrum is. Okay, so what was good about this? This was a more efficient, ordered, you know, structured use of the security representative's time. So this, we did achieve that goal. We also found that developers were starting to reach out to us more proactively, uh, not just on the stories that were sort of mandated that they needed to, but in general, they were now becoming more familiar with me, more familiar with the process and reaching out and asking questions. And then we also found that this process, we were trying 
turned out to be very flexible and resilient. We had changes like the split into three teams. We uh, also had the development organization change tracking systems, and we were able to continue on using the same process we had defined. Uh, but we did have some bad. In particular, you know, we tried to reduce the time commitment, but that three-way split brought the time back up. So it went from two hours down to half an hour or less, and now we're back up to maybe an hour and a half of meetings. Uh, and this was now every week because they were doing shorter sprints. Also bad, during the Scrum training, I recognized that we were violating Scrum in a different way, which is that by reviewing these stories and defining security criteria after the planning meeting, that meant we were changing the story after it had already been pointed, so it had already been scoped for how much work needs to be done, and then we were coming in after that, after they said, okay, we're gonna do this much work, and now we're coming in and saying, oh, and there's also this other work that you need to do as well. So we were adding more work. Also, a single point of failure. At this point, I was really the only one closely involved with this development team, and if I wasn't there, there was no one there to look at this. Uh, you know, in the normal process, there was always other representatives around, like Chris and my coworkers, that were there to answer questions, but in terms of the, the structured approach, I was it. So we realized we needed to move back in time. We needed to move earlier into this process and do these evaluations and determine the security implications earlier. We needed to do it before the planning meeting. And that we also needed to distribute this among multiple security representatives, not just one. Another thing that I discovered through the Scrum training is we weren't really meeting with the ideal representative in that we were meeting with a development manager and not necessarily from someone from the actual development team. So the third Scrum concept is the Scrum roles. So first is the product owner. So this is a single individual. This is the representative, sort of could be from the business side. This is the person who's responsible for the product and making sure the product is valuable. So they're responsible for grooming that product backlog, making sure that the right work is identified and that the most valuable work is the highest priority. Um, they are the single interface to the team for sort of all external stakeholders, whether that be management or customers. This is the single point. If you want access to that team, you're supposed to go through the product owner. Second is the scrum master. So while the product owner is focused on the product, the scrum master is more focused on the team and specifically the process the team is using, making sure they're adhering to the, to the rules of scrum and uh, facilitating meetings, making sure everything's going smoothly. They can also be involved in helping remove blockers one sort of hard rule is that the Scrum Master cannot also be the product owner, because you would now have a conflict where the person dictating, this is what I want you to do, is also now the one who's supposed to be making sure the process is going smoothly and the team is being protected, so there's a bit of a conflict. And you might have someone just saying, oh, you guys should be able to do twice as much work this sprint as you did last time, and twice as much the time after that. And then finally, you have the team, so this is, a group of seven plus or minus two, so five to nine team members that are supposed to be multifunctional. This can be developers, QA testers, DBAs, uh, user interface, user experience designers, security designers or architects. And the idea is that they are self-organizing and they move to where the work is. You don't necessarily have, these are the developers, these are the testers. If this sprint has a lot of testing work to be done, everyone can be a tester. So this helps in you know, cross-training and learning and making sure everyone has a, a, a chance to do a lot of different things. So also during the Scrum Master training, I realized that I could see in terms of how we could distribute this, there were kind of different roles that I was doing that corresponded to some of these Scrum roles. 
So first uh, is what we call the security architect, which corresponds to the product owner. So this is someone who is closely affiliated with one specific product, and they're focused on the security of that product and making sure that they're closely integrated with that team, know what's happening on that team, what work's being done, and what the possible ramifications are. Second is what we call the security engineers, which correspond to the Scrum development team members. So these are, so while the security architect is sort of a more strategic view, the security engineers are more tactical and can be brought in on any, any product, working for any team, and doing individual tasks like pen testing, code review, reviewing the static results. And this was really a, a key idea of how we could eliminate the single point of failure and start distributing this workload amongst you know, the, the rest of the security team. So phase three, we decided to put this into action. So the process now was that before planning, the security architect would meet with the product owner and go through the product backlog. So we would look at what's at the top of the list for what's likely to be done when the next sprint starts and do that same review. Go through the stories, find out which things have possible security ramifications. And now we actually started the same way developers were tracking the work to be done, we started tracking the security work to be done in more detail along with those stories. So if there were specific security concerns that could be revealed by a code review, we would define that in the acceptance criteria of the story, okay, you need to be doing this, this, and this, or this story is not considered complete. And we would actually have a, a subtask or a substory that would be assigned to the security engineer about the details of that review to be done. So this was, this was a big improvement over the previous sort of, you need to get sign off. This was much more detailed. So after those stories had been properly groomed and now security groomed, they could be fed into the planning meeting. Then coming out of the planning meeting, we now have formal tasks for developers as well as formal tasks for the security team, for the security engineers. And the security engineers were now independently operating, working with the relevant representatives of the development team to make sure that this story is completed, including the security review. And the goal here was to complete that security task and find possible issues as well as fix those issues during the sprint. So that's the goal, is to complete this when the development team is focused on it, not after the fact, when they're trying to do something else. Let's try to find it early and fix it early. So what did we find was good about this? Planning, pre-planning, turned out to be a much better point to inject security into this conversation. We now were more involved in the design discussion. So we had a chance to make sure security was taken into consideration at the earliest point these conversations were happening. This also meant that they, as a development team, were able to do more accurate story pointing. If they knew that security had to be involved or they knew that there was additional testing they needed to do, they knew that going in. We had better visibility here, both for ourselves and for the rest of the team, by virtue of that we were tracking things the same way the development team was tracking them. So this was better organization for us as well as more transparency for them so that they knew the security pieces we owned were tracked in the same system in the same way they tracked theirs and they could see what do we still need to do, what's actively being worked on, and what's already done. And at this point, by using the security architect, security engineers model, we were distributing that workload amongst other security representatives and eliminating that single point of failure. So the downside here is things were more complex. We have more people involved, so we were taking up time, not just from me, but starting to take up time from my coworkers as well. 
and just generally a, a higher level of complexity in the process we're defining at this point. But So things that we could be doing better are training. We still would like to improve how much training our developers get that's focused purely on security. And we'd also like to make sure we're fully incorporating security, not just into the development work, but into all the work that the team is doing, testing and everything, and making sure that's very closely integrated and repeatable. Uh, and the, the biggest result of this, though, has been that really security is, is being seen more as core to the whole team, not a separate organization completely. Okay, I'm gonna hand it back to Chris. All right, so one thing I think that is, is worth pointing out just um, specifically, as we've talked about security architects, which is essentially Ryan, and security engineers, remember these are not full-time people. These are people on, the, on our security research team that are building product and that working on these code reviews and consultations and pen tests and all this stuff is essentially a very, very small part of their job. So again, we haven't hired anybody that is purely focused on SDL. I just wanna make that clarification in case the, uh, that got lost since the, the beginning. All right, so let's talk about future. So as you know by now, Scrum is all about constant reevaluation, seeing what's working, seeing what's not working, and getting better. So security teams have to adapt, and we're having to adapt as well. I can tell you for certain that two or three months from now, our development process is going to look completely different than it, did, than it does today. Maybe not completely different, but at least significantly different. Because all these different teams, we're up to seven or eight Scrum teams now across different product lines. All these teams are changing the way they work and evaluating how they're working. So I'll give you some examples. We just spun up something called a platform sustaining team. And they're primarily tasked with things that you could broadly describe as technical debt. Here's the thing. They're not working in Agile Scrum. They're using Kanban, which I won't go into, but suffice it to say is not Scrum. So they don't do iterations, yet the code that they produce is going into the release, yet we don't have as much visibility into it because of the way that it's being doled out and completed. So that's tough. We have to actually keep an eye on that. Um, the whole idea of using part-time researchers as the scrum teams, as the devel development team scales, um, that in and of itself does not scale. So we have to find a better way to start teaching the QA team how to do some of the things that we do, whether it's basic code reviews or even putting more precise coding guidelines around what they're doing. Again, not generic guidelines, but very specific, precise coding guidelines that are unique to each team and each product. And that way they can do some of the work that we would do, or at least we can, our portion of it can be a little bit easier. We need to start doing static analysis every release, uh, sorry, every sprint instead of every release. And we kind of talked about that already, that you need to have a notion of a shipping product uh, at the end of every sprint. So that's an improvement that we'll probably make. And then I've been exploring the idea of carving out dedicated, um, dedicated time in the sprint to work on security debt. So as you all know, security debt piles up over time. There's features and improvements that you want to make that you know, they get outweighed by customer requests or other features on the roadmap. And as a result, some of the security stuff doesn't get done. So what if you could say every sprint we're going to dedicate five out of the 60 or 70 points to security debt? That would be kind of cool and it would help us catch up. Another thing you could do is to do a, a full-on security sprint. And you could say, for this week's sprint, everything we take in from the backlog is a security story. Um, I think this could be really good. I haven't really pushed very hard for it yet. I might do that, just to see how it works. But I think it could be a valuable way to catch up and do some things that are, that are meaningful. Now, just to make sure I'm not painting too rosy of a picture here, um, there have been a lot of challenges along the way as we've gone through this evolution. And some of that has been already talked about a little bit in the retro slides that, um, that Ryan presented at the end of each phase. But let me give you some more examples and elaborate on, on kind of what we're seeing. So at one point, we had some what we call rogue development work taking place. And that's not to say that the developer himself was rogue and he was doing malicious things. What it means is work being done outside of the sprint. 
So this one guy had a task to go and review all of the interceptors in the Java web app like across the board. So it wasn't a specific store for that sprint, and he was kind of working outside the team. He was a part-time contractor, or is a part-time contractor. And so that work that he did was not visible to us because it wasn't part of a sprint. And so that was tough. I, I, we had to kind of you know, scramble a little bit to kind of figure out what was going on there. Um, the platform team, which was the team we started out with, is fully bought into this approach, and they're, they're really good. Um, they, like Ryan said, they're coming to us. They're working very closely with us. Newer teams that have spun up have been a little bit of a challenge just to kind of get into the culture, into the mindset of, of how we're doing things. And, um, you know, I'll give you one example of things that have been happening lately, actually. So you have the feature story, and then you have the security story that's attached to it. And so sometimes the dev team will hand over the feature, the code, to be reviewed, like the code diff, like two hours before the sprint ends, which, again, not our full-time job. So you, not, you might, might not necessarily be able to finish that task before the sprint ends. So what they would do was they'd say, oh, well, we finished our part. We're going to split off your task and make it a separate story, and we'll push that into the next sprint. And that completely like, violates everything about Scrum. Right? You can't take the acceptance criteria out of the story and just make it in the next sprint. But they would do that so that they could take credit for the story and, and have their, you know, their points, uh, story points completed, um, you know, take credit for that. And there's some balance here. We're not technically a full accountable part of the team, so they felt like we were an externality and therefore they shouldn't have to rely on us for that. But anyway, we're working through that, but that's one of the tough things that, that can happen. Another one is that... Um, you know, we talked about doing a lot of this stuff during grooming, right? That's working pretty well with the product owners. Turns out grooming is not a scrum ritual, right? Grooming is something that we're doing to get the backlog in order and figure out what's coming, but grooming is not a requirement of Agile Scrum. So the outcome of that is that some of our teams are doing grooming and some of them are not. Some of them have something that's called grooming, but what they're actually doing is doing more of a problem-solving session where they're breaking up an epic story down into its component stories. And so it's not really grooming, it's more of a, a deconstruction meeting. So the result of this has been more one-on-ones with product owners that, um, that are happening, that, that are not happening during what we're calling the grooming meeting, or what we, what we refer to as the grooming meetings. And um, I got two more, which I'll, I'll kind of go through really quick. Geography is a, is a tough one. Uh, Ryan is sitting right next to the developers, so he can kind of work with them and, you know, go find the scrum master or whatever. Uh, but the guy I have running all the dynamic product SDL stuff is actually in Tokyo. So <laughs> he can't walk down the hall, he can't, like, spot somebody and, and go grab them. Uh, so it makes communication a little bit harder. Um, to his credit, you know, the, he stays up really late and we just have meetings at times that, that work for both sides. But that can be difficult uh, as a challenge as you try to scale out the team and scale out the number of security architects. Um, so, you know, ultimately there's, there's this sort of uh, approach that I feel that I have to do that's a challenge. I have to constantly socialize SDL with the new teams, and I constantly have to keep reaffirming support from the executives from all the other teams. Otherwise, the sort of the little daily um, complaints that may come from developers eventually eat away at the executives and they start to, you know, they start to lose support for it and you kind of have to rem remind them to get back, get them back on your side and figure out, like, why are you doing what you're doing and, and what the ultimate goal is. So you kind of work it from both ends. You work from the executive side for buy-in and, and support, but then you also really have a responsibility to work it from the bottom as well and understanding, you know, what those developers' pain points are and, and how you can um, do your best to work alongside them and compromise. Because the more you respect their process, the more that they are going to respect your process. So that's it. I hope what you take away from this is that you know, this can be done. Uh, it does take some effort, take some flexibility. And I think over time, you'll start to see increased trust from the product teams. You'll see that they suddenly have better intuition about security, which is not a surprise. Like They actually get that through repetition and through the, the constant involvement. But it will seem like suddenly, like, wow, these guys are like, really getting it now. And so, uh, and just remember, don't try and duplicate this, or at least not the last 
phase. Because it's, that would be a gener generic approach. You have to go back and think about how you can apply some of the processes and techniques to the nuances of your own Scrum teams and constantly remember to be evaluating along the way what's working, what's not working, what should we change. So that's it. I thank you for coming. And uh, I don't know if we have time for any questions. One question. Manico gets the question. Uh-oh. So, so Chris, I actually only came in here to get ammo so I can be raging over Twitter, but this is probably the most realistic topic that's out there that we can talk about. Um, so I just want to ask you about the Twitter thing. Is that good? Thank you, Jim. Jim gave me a compliment. <laughs> 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 Write down, note this date. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>